All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome back to Derek and College Bowl Podcast. Today, me and Nick here with 2023 preview and prediction for the Virginia Cavaliers. One of his coaching staff, Tony Elliott, back for his second season. He was with Clemson from 2011 to 2021. Finally made the jump up to a head coaching position this past offseason. Well, two offseasons ago, that is. Des Kitching, second year in role as offensive coordinator in John Rodzinski. He was with Air Force for also a decade, and this will be his second year in his role. And obviously, the only headline really with Virginia, Nick, is uh, Devin Chandler, Lavelle Davis, Deshaun Perry. Tragically, the lives were taken back in a November shooting. Very awful tragedy that has you know, really plagued Charlottesville. Led to the final two games of the season being canceled. Also put Tony Elliott in just a very tough emotional state as you know a first-year head coach having to manage the emotions of this just unfortunate tragedy that's happened here at Virginia. You know, Lavelle Davis was a guy that I always singled out the last two years, Nick, as a highly impressive football player. I think he was six seven. Uh, had some nice speed, long strider. This is a guy that I was a big fan of, and I was just unfortunate to hear that him and the lives of Devin Chandler and Deshaun Perry were taken about eight months ago. You know, what's the feeling right now on campus and your assumption? What do you think this is going to be like for Virginia this year? Obviously, a very tough situation that's going to be hard to forget. Obviously, it's going to be a tough situation for UVA as a whole as they move into transitioning to playing football again after this terrible tragedy. You know, it's similar to the response that Frank Beamer and Virginia Tech had after the tragic shooting on that campus in 2007, which took the lives of a lot of students that day. They came out, they played, they had a very tough, emotional comeback in that first game back at Virginia Tech. They released the balloons and all that. I would expect a similar response during their first home game for UVA. Obviously, this was a terrible tragedy to lose these talented players. All three of them were really good, talented football players, Chandler, Perry and Davis, you know, like you said, Davis, especially very talented young man that has really been putting together a lot of things that were good for this program. It's it's a tough thing. Obviously, you know, it's an issue that happens with gun violence in this country, and it's disappointing to see that it affected uh, members of the college football community. I mean, we both took this pretty seriously when it happened. And now, you know, we're several months on and we're approaching the point where the football is going to return, you know, for this team in Charlottesville, it's going to be a big step in the right direction the healing process on this campus when they open when they have their home opener against james madison on september 9th it's obviously a very tragic situation and it overshadowed a team that you know is in transitioning last year and it's gonna be a tough adjustment another tough piece for tony elliott to handle i respect and commend the way these handle it so far very tough thing to find himself in looking at the cavalier offense this is a unit that struggled significantly last season the schematic change did not do them any favors at all the year prior brendan armstrong put on a clinic you know he had 40 plus total touchdowns 4500 yards through the air and this past season he was awful nick he had more picks than touchdowns he ends up transferring out to nc state reuniting with robert and i he really misses him clearly and he especially missed him last year they averaged only 17 points per game could do nothing you know watching brendan armstrong i was like what happened to this guy nick he had no confidence one bit early on in the seasons when that started and it you know trickled down the rest of this unit certainly did not benefit from that one bit you know tony musket comes over from monmouth 6 2 2 10 three-year starter there 5700 yards 51 touchdowns really making waves this summer you know jay wolf folk threw a few passes in 2021 and true freshman three-star anthony coladera very young room here musket is not the answer obviously coming over from the fcs level they're going to be plagued even worse than they were last year nick which is hard to imagine it's tough having a transition where now you have a quarterback that's played at the FCS level. The stats are impressive at Monmouth, but you have to take that with a consideration that he was moving over from FCS level. Brandon Armstrong just absolutely flat out disappointed. Yes, the schematic change certainly played a role in that, but Armstrong is a lot better than seven touchdowns and 12 interceptions. And now you move to a guy with Musket who just does not have the experience in playing the FBS level. 6'2", 210, I think the size is nice. You know, solid player in practice. The film has looked good in practice from what I understand and was a good three-year starter at Monmouth, but it's very, be a tough transition moving to the FC, from the FCS level to the FBS level. And just another question mark for this Virginia team that has a lot of question marks this season. And you look at the backfield, you know, they were 102nd nationally in running the ball last season. Kobe Pace, a physical back from Clemson, reunites with Tony Elliott. Paris Jones was a quite sound runner in his brief snaps. I think a bigger role is in store for him. And then Mike Collins, Nick, what a miracle it was for him to be able to practice this offseason. His heroic acts during that awful shooting went back to the bus to try and help, uh, you know, other students. Ended up shot multiple times and in critical condition. Uh, just amazing things. Mike Collins, of course, transferred over from Miami last season. He did, of course, you know, a horrible way to end the year, but this guy is a hero on campus, Nick. And this is certainly going to be a year where him and his team can hopefully celebrate his actions on that fateful day. Certainly, Mike Hollis has to be, you know, Harold is a hero. He really is a hero for what he did. And if he can find a way 
to be fully healthy and be involved with his team. I know he's practiced at points this offseason. I really want to see him get involved. That would be a really good emotional moment for this campus. It's very you know heroic actions that he did. You know, I don't think any of us would have jumped into the situation like he did, given what was going on there. A true hero from him. And Paris Jones, you know, he's a solid running back as well. He had limited touches in eight games, 365 yards, and two scores for him. They bring over pace from Clemson. You know, he's got some nice attributes, solid running back, physical back. So I think this is not a terrible backfield. They were terrible on the ground last year, 123 yards per game on the ground. They need to find a way to raise that number. They have two talented backs here that can certainly help with that. The last two seasons, the receiving core has been highly talented, but they return only one of their top six pass catchers. Keen Thompson, a former quarterback, transferred over to the wide receiver position. He was great for them last year, but he didn't even score a touchdown last season. He's, of course, now gone. That's just disappointing, though, Nick, when one of your top talents cannot even find the end zone because that's how poor you are. Malik Washington, a nice, speedy pass catcher from Northwestern, certainly put up some good production for the Wildcats last year. Goes from one bad QB situation to another, Nick, so I really feel for Washington here. Uh, Malachi Fields, an exciting prospect, 6'4", 214, suffered a torn ACL last spring. He's ready to get back on the field this season to make Starling win a few grabs. True freshman Jaden Gibson, a speedy, elusive player, made some waves in the spring, 6'1", 185. A very inexperienced receiving group, top to bottom, Nick. I think Malik Washington, though, he did this exact same thing last year, so I expect him this year to come in and step up and be a leader for this group that's, again, the exact same situation he had at Northwestern. Malik Washington is a very talented player to add for your team. It's a very nice add here from Tony Elliott and Co. I think he's a good player. Malachi Fields, an exciting prospect. He had limited appearances, played only one game at 58 catches and a score for him. So very small sample size, but impressive numbers nonetheless for him, which I think is really nice to see. Demick Starling as well. He's recovering from injuries, but he had 75 yards on three catches last year. So I think this is a group that has a lot of room for improvement. But Malik Washington is a nice game, game changer to add to your unit. Look at the offensive line. You know, last year we talked about the youth and lack of depth. They were one of the offense. nation's worst pass blocking groups from a season ago. Now certainly expected. McKeel Boyle is back at left tackle. He was awful in his five games. Ty Furnish was forward at center. About 16 pressures in 10 games. Noah Josie, 6'5", 316. He was a quite, quite solid run blocker. Again, didn't offer much in pass protection. Knows. It's a bit of a theme they have coming over from last season. Six games for him. Jimmy Chris transfers over from Penn State. Uganda Nanana, a few snaps at Houston, 6'4", 300. He's in a slot in that right tackle. Brian Stevens was a great player for Dayton, hoping he can provide some value on the interior offensive line. They've recruited this position hard, so they've added some important depth. Uh, the offensive line should be better this fall, Nick. But the guys I just mentioned, they didn't play a lot of games last year. When they did, they weren't good. So I think long term, they're certainly going to see some improvements on this side of the ball. But for 2023, not expecting too much. Certainly need to find a way to improve this pass blocking group. They were very poor last year and they returned some nice players, but they do have a lot of room to grow up. Noah Josie, I love the size at 6'5", 316. I think it's a fantastic size, but he's not great as a pass blocker in limited appearances. Jimmy Chris transfers from Penn State. I like him. I think he's got some high upside, certainly. Brian Stevens is a great, was a great player at Dayton. You know, he could be good on the interior. You can move him on the left side or the right side. I think he's got potential at either sides. Overall, it's a unit that needs a lot of improvement. I think this offense has to improve a lot of places overall, but I think the offensive line is a very big issue for them. They need to find a way to be better in pass block. Yeah, obviously they need to improve. I think the biggest thing overall is better efficiency, 3.7 yards per carry. And then, you know, the efficiency in the passing game, 54.1% comp rate as a team, 6.5 yards per attempt, just horrid numbers. So they really need to improve on that front. C offense for me, I definitely think this backfield's pretty intriguing. I think they can get some better lanes. I think they can certainly produce. I'm very interested by Tony Musket, again, coming over from Monmouth. I think Tony Elliott sees something. Very interested to see what that may be when the season kicks off here in a couple weeks. I think Tony Musket's an interesting piece to add this offense for me. I think a C might be a little bit too high. I'm closer to a C minus. For me, I just think the efficiency is very poor. This team did not produce 17 point per game. is just a terrible number in the ACC for when you have a coach like Tony Elliott, who's an offensive minded head coach coming over and struggling to get more than 20 points per game in his first season. Transition certainly schematically is part of that. I think, you know, Muskett's a good quarterback and I'm excited to see what he can make the transition, but it's a tough jump from FCS to FBS. I'm interested to see how that works out. Well, again, the defensive side of the ball, they returned six starters. They only added two players in the secondary, ended up losing six guys in the portal. Pretty sound unit last year, top to bottom, Nick. You look at the defensive line. Cam Butler was a pretty sound run defender. Ben Smiley was awful. He'll run with the second unit. Chico Bennett, he was the team's top leading pass rusher. Certainly needs to showcase more consistency, but he's certainly a high upside uh, talent right there. Paul Akira was a poor tackler. Had some solid production, though. Weak interior D-line. Aaron Famu, Jameer Carter, 6'2", 3'13". You know, the defensive line helped put up 30 sacks, and the run defense really wasn't all that awful. It was a pretty solid unit, top to bottom, despite the talent 
not being the strongest Nick I think maybe Tony Elliott is certainly some of that knowledge he had from working with Brent Venables for you know a decade I think it was he certainly picked up a little bit of what he was putting down I think and I think that's certainly something that we need to consider when you talk about this defense it's not a bad front seven certainly this front unit on the defensive line has some talented pieces you know Cam Butler I think is a good player for 29 total tackles four and a half tackles for loss three sacks for him Ben Smiley needs to improve greatly he had 13 tackles and to- a one and a half tackle for loss and a sack for him he needs to find a way to improve certainly I think he has potential Jaheen Carter is another player solid 29 total tackles for him I like the numbers out of him Chico Bennett very good player you know seven and a half tackles for loss seven sacks leading the team in sacks good numbers return top sack sack getter 34 total tackles for him so there are some nice pieces in this unit I think there are some guys here who have some nice potential overall this unit does get after the quarterback another guy like Aaron Fumani as well he had 39 total tackles eight and a half tackles lost four sacks so the sack production was pretty solid on this team this past season they need to find a way to continue to keep that up that 30 sacks was in 10 games it's something you should add you know three sacks a game it's a pretty good number right there look at the middle of the defense Josh Earn was solid in his seven games 6'3 234 some more unique size from an inside linebacker Steve Bracey only a few snaps James Jackson was below average in his 500 or so snaps but he did have 60 stops Trey McDonald behind him with limited experience it's a quite below average group transfer of Nick Jackson to Iowa not helpful one bit but this team in the past has had great players in its linebacking core Jackson being the latest example of that not sure if that trend will continue in this Tony Elliott John Rosinski era Nick uh, but it's something I'm certainly going to take into consideration. So I think they'll step up and be a little bit better than we, what we currently see on paper. Uh, 71st against the run last year. If they want that number to improve, these guys are going to have to be big in trying to establish some presence on the interior. Tough to lose guy like Nick Jackson, who is a really talented, hard-hitting linebacker who moved to Iowa. Great piece for that team to add. James Jackson, six total tackles in his appearances and not a bad number at all. He also had a tackle for loss and a sack to boot. Pretty solid numbers for him. Josh Ahern as well, limited appearances, but he had 26 total tackles in six games, one and a half tackles for loss, and a sack for him. I think those are decent numbers. This is going to be a by committee approach. Now, these guys are really super talented standouts here, but they have some nice pieces they can kind of rotate in and use at different parts of the game. And you look at the secondary, you know, the transfer of Fentrell Cypress, that's going to be big. He departs for Florida State. Malcolm Green, he was a solid slot corner for Clemson. He heads over, doesn't have much experience in his career, though, but when he was on the field, he certainly made a bit of an impact. Tavon Kyle comes over from Iowa State to occupy a cornerback spot. He's shown good flashes in the past, but it's coming off a real tough season. Antonio Clary was a really good player at safety for them. Needs to step up his coverage, though. Um, you know, he needs to improve his coverage a solid bit, I'd say. You know, he's a trusty tackler, a nice run defender. Cohen King was great in his six games. Very excited for what the safety duo can accomplish. Jonas Sanker was an admirable corner. Secondary's worst game was 293, allowed versus North Carolina in a close loss against Drake May. Overall, this is a good secondary, Nick, and you see why. You know, they were 30th against the pass this, you know, um, in, back in 2022. And I think they're certainly going to be right around that mark again. Again, losing Cypress is certainly big, but the safety duo of Cleary and King, I think, is going to lead the way for them, and everyone else is going to follow. Cleary is a good player, 56 total tackles, nice hard hitter in eight games. Coverage certainly needs to be worked on. King as well, 44 total tackles for him. He needs to work on his coverage as well. Jonas Sanker, I like him, 63 total tackles, top returning tackler for this team. He had two pass breakups as well. Overall, this is a decent secondary unit. They're pretty good at times last year. I think they have some nice unit, some nice pieces of stuff here to be involved. They, you know, the pass yards per game at, in 30th in the nation at 204 is a really solid number. If they can keep that in that same range, I'd be very impressed and we go a long way in helping out this defense. I think the biggest thing that needs to improve is you know the run defense had issues more often than not. B minus for me though. I certainly think the sack numbers were impressive. The two safeties we talked about. The defensive line overall, they seem to be more impactful than they should, which is something that can certainly be concerning because if they start to play to where their talent suggests, then you're going to see a big step back middle of the defense. Uh, you know, We'll see what happens with them. B-minus for me, though, Dick. I certainly think they played good last year. I think they'll be right around that same ballpark. Maybe a slight fall-off, though. Certainly, they're a respectful defense. You know, 24 points per game is not a bad number, 50, around 50th in the nation. The pass, yard, pass defense was fantastic. That number could be in the same range. I'd be very impressed. I think this is a good unit on paper that has some nice, talented pieces. You know, I'd be closer to a C plus. I think they're just an average unit overall, but they do have some nice redeeming factors. They can certainly cut, push to that B range for me if they improve early on. Look at the schedule preview and prediction. Hearts will continue to be with the Virginia program and all the families in Charlottesville. This offense is flat out doomed, though. Interested to see what Tony Musket does. Offensive line is only going to showcase marginal improvements, and it won't really allow the run game to have a high ceiling. Defense has some good players, and they've certainly played good ball, but very skewed numbers, I'd say, with who they all played. That's one thing I probably should have mentioned a minute ago, Nick, that who they played was certainly not great offenses one bit. 
expect a sizable step back. It's going to be a tough year for Virginia, any way you put it. I think they'll be better than expected, though. I think we'll see some close games. It could certainly find its way to the over. I'm going to stay away from it, though. Three and nine for me. The non-conference is brutal, even with the win over James Madison. The Dukes are not a walkover by any means. I think William and Mary is a given. And I think they'll knock off Georgia Tech at home on the 4th of November. Other than that, don't, I don't see many more wins, but the schedule isn't all that difficult. Nick, I think they could steal a few here. Uh, that, it would be shocking if they did. Right, this is going to be a tough season, certainly on campus, obviously. This is a lot more than football this year with what happened on campus, the tragedy, and it's a healing process. And you expect that with this team. Emotions going to be running high. This is a very tough schedule, though, having to play Tennessee and Maryland out of conference, including a trip to College Park. Very difficult. They're playing Tennessee in Nashville at the Titan Stadiums. That's a very interesting out of conference. You know, ri not necessarily a rivalry game, but the two states are not too far from each other. Charlottesville and uh, Knoxville aren't terribly, terribly far from each other. The in-conference schedule is tough. You know, trips to North Carolina, Miami, Louisville, all very difficult trips. Certainly hosting Duke at home. They get their rival Virginia Tech at home as well. They could potentially steal that game to close off a season. If they get the four and eight, that would be a, a little bit better of a season for them. Tough season for Tony Elliott and co. It was already going to be a tough season given what they had on the roster, but this offseason, you know, tragedy is not making things any easier for the Virginia Tech Cavaliers, or Virginia Cavaliers, I beg my pardon. Uh, it's going to be a tough season overall, certainly, you know, not what Virginia fans want to see, but this is going to be the first season in a step of healing and they can get towards building a better and great program in the future. We'd certainly love to see plenty of success this year for the Cavs and Tony Elliott and this bunch. It's going to be it for today's episode, Nick. I appreciate you joining me. Not an easy episode to do today. Tough episode overall, certainly, you know, heavy hearts with the Virginia Cavalier family as we continue to go into football season. Hopefully this is a healing process for this team. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. See you next time.